Now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, <coughs> Professor Shai Efrati. Uh, Shai is the head of the Department of Nephrology at Asafa Rofe, now called Itzhak Shamir Medical Center in Israel, and Rishon Lezion, I think Bedagan, whatever it's called. Uh, he also heads the center, the Sagol Center for Hyper Hyperbaric Medicine at Asafa Rofe. And uh, he has made a number of unique distinctions. So Shai received his MD from the medical school at Ben-Gurion University, and then he did a residency in internal medicine. And then he specialized in something which is very uncommon, which is diving medicine. I don't know how many of you have gone to a diving doctor. There are not that many of those. Uh, I assume you must also be a very good diver, even though I didn't check with you, but I, I assume you are. Uh, and this led him, uh, perhaps the most distinctive uh, component of diving medicine is hyperbaric chambers, which are used to treat divers who are, were unfortunate enough to go back to the surface when they were still supposed to be in water, and therefore they are in big trouble. So starting with these unfortunate divers, or fortunate enough to reach the hyperbaric chamber in time, uh, Shai decided to look beyond divers, and he made some rather surprising and exciting discoveries that go far beyond diving medicine, and this led to the establishment of the Hyperbaric Medicine Center at Asafa Rufe, and this also led him to be invited to talk here, and he's going to tell us about what hyperbaric medicine can do to non-divers, and maybe also to divers. Shai, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have two goals of being here. The first of all is to say thank you very much to you, the Adam family, for everything you are doing to our small startup, which is named the State of Israel, <laughs> who could have been established without amazing people like you. So first of all, thank you very much. It's just amazing. And my second goal is we have here the future in front of us, and this is the young scientist. But we also have, in addition to the scientists, we have the parents of the scientist. And as a parent myself, I know how proud you are in this moment. And like any other thing, they are your work. So by the name of the State of Israel, I'm saying, first of all, thank you very much to the parents for everything you are doing. You have done wonderful and just amazing. I would try to give you, you know, when you come into a lecture, you can give data. But more important, more important than the data itself is to understand a new way of thinking. And what I will try to do to you, because you are coming from multidiscipline teams, is to demonstrate to you a journey that we started. We are still in the journey, but I want you to take our way of thinking and maybe use it to other, to other fields that you are in. And we will start with this. What's that? That's the universe. It's huge. Okay. It's so huge that from ahead we are saying this is probably too big for us. We can send Bereshit to somewhere over there to see if we can learn a little bit more. But it's huge and it makes us be modest. And if we are looking at this, this is the universe. And this is one, one brain cell. And this is how it looks. And when you are looking at this, there are two things that you can say. You can say, oh shit, it's too big for me, I don't want to get into it. <laughs> this is the one thing that you can say. The other thing you say, wow, this is huge. Let's see what I can do with it. How can I make a change? But looking at this, it makes you also become another thing. It makes you modest. You know saying? most of the things I don't know. And then you start to think, okay, so how can I affect 
such a complex, huge neurological system. We need to simplify it. How can we simplify such a thing? There are many people that are investigating the brain. And each investigator thinks that what he's doing, that's the crucial part. If I will do that, I can cure all the disease related to that. And there are people that are dealing with the <coughs> blood vessels, people that are dealing with the neurons, the glia cells. Some are dealing with the receptor or the chemical entities that are moving from one place to the other. This is huge. We think, how can we simplify it? We need to learn, we are looking for the bottleneck. We should look at the basic of the process. We are saying from ahead, the system is so complicated. Let's see what the system needs in order to do the things that he knows to do. And there is, sorry for the picture, but in order to simplify it, I'm starting with this. Looking over here, what do we see? We see a wound. And in this wound, we can see that there is a necrotic tissue over here. And we see a tissue over here that if we will bring to this tissue, without knowing the specific details of what's going on inside, but if we will bring good oxygenation, stem cells, and we will speak about the stem cells in a few minutes, and generation of new blood vessels, this part will cure. What's that? It's the same thing. There is a necrotic tissue, and surrounding the necrotic tissue, we can see a tissue, again, that if we will bring good oxygenation, stem cells, the trigger that we need for regeneration, it will heal. What is the main difference between that and that? This, we see. We understand what we are dealing with. It's materialized. You see it. You smell it. You know what you are dealing with. This is high tech. We are looking at CT, at MRI. We are speaking about the brain in a mystic fashion. Cognitive, personality. It's a tissue. And we only need to simplify the tissue and see this tissue the way we look at, at this tissue. There is an amazing investigator that I'm sure everybody here is familiar with. It's Michal Schwartz. And she's amazing, and I hope she will get the Nobel Prize in a couple of years from today, because we need no more Nobel Prize here in Israel. And this is what she actually says. She's saying the brain is a tissue, and the wound is a wound. And whatever we need in order to cure that wound, which is a peripheral wound, we need it also to treat this wound that we have in the brain. And what are the basic that we need for wound care? We need energy, which is the oxygen. Because if we don't have oxygen, nothing will happen. Okay? You can put something on your hand and close the blood flow. What will happen to the hand? Not something good. Okay? We need a trigger that will trigger the regenerative process. We need stem cells, we will speak about it. And we need angiogenesis, generation of new blood vessels. And we will move one by one, okay? Like an engineer, you need to simplify the system. Okay, saying I need oxygen, let's see how I do it. I need the trigger, let's see how I do that, etc., etc. So we'll go one by one. The first thing is oxygen. And if we are speaking about the brain, you know, the brain is only, is less than 5% than our body mass. It's not dependent on how big your brain is, it depends how big your body is, okay? That's the percentage. So it's around 5% or 2% depends on the body that you have. But this organ over here consumes something like 20% of the overall blood flow. 25% of the overall energy that our body uses. So if somebody wants to do a diet, the best thing is to think a little bit more, okay? <laughs> That's the most important thing. And we can play with it. And oxygen is a rate-limiting factor for brain activity even at baseline. 
you know that at each time point we are using something like 8% or 9% of our maximal brain capacity. There are some elite person like Perez, we spoke before about Perez, he probably uses much more. But we human beings are limited to something like 10%. And what the brain is doing at each time point, he is saying what is the most important part that the brain needs now, and he will move the blood flow for this part. We are using that in what we call functional MRI, what we are doing in functional MRI. We ask the person to move the hand, we see blood flow to the part that's responsible for the hand movement, we're saying, okay, this is responsible for the hand. Leg, etc., etc. So we want to understand whether oxygen is a rate-limiting factor for brain activity. In order to do that, we took healthy students, neuropsychology students that are supposed to be smart, okay? And we gave them to do multitasking, okay? Multitasking meaning you need to do a motor <coughs> task together with a cognitive task, different parts of the brain. The classical example for that is if you are speaking on the cellular phone, okay? You are driving and speaking on the cellular phone, you are missing the turn. Why is that? Because the blood flow is going to a certain location, and then you don't have enough blood flow to the rest. So it's a limitation. And we are taking them into the chamber. We can play with the oxygen with the hyperbaric chamber. You can see that when we are increasing the amount of oxygen, the cognitive function is improving. So oxygen is a rate limiting factor for brain activity as baseline. What happens when you have an injury? You know, there are crazy people who prefer to live in such a high altitude. Why they are crazy? Because the oxygen level there is relatively low. And what we see, which is very interesting, that if these people have stroke in this very high altitude, the mortality over here is around 40%, which is unbelievable to the Western medicine today. We can challenge that with animals, we can use pulsing model, etc., etc., and we can see that if we are decreasing the oxygen level during injury, the results are not so good. So we can change it. For that, we have the hyperbaric chamber, increasing the pressure, increasing the oxygen to as much as we want. So we have the first thing. The other thing is a trigger. The body, our body, our biology is lazy. It will not do anything unless you trigger it. And if we want to trigger regenerative process, the most powerful trigger that we have is hypoxia, lack of oxygen. Because this is a signal of a disaster. And if there is a disaster, the body will start to work on the regenerative process. So if I want to generate it, for example, we have something we call HIF, which stands for hypoxic induced factor. It's a transcriptor factor, which means that once it's up, it affects a lot of expression of different genes. So if we want to take it up, we can take a person, hold his breath, stop his heartbeat, he will be with hypoxia, and then we have the HIF, the trigger. There is only slight problem. It's not healthy. Okay? So we thought about it. So we cannot do that. So what we would do? It happens to be that everything in life is relative. There is no absolute values. Nothing. That. I will feel that I am rich or poor, not based on the absolute value that I have. Depends what my neighbor has. If he has more than me, I will say, oh, I have, but I need some more. If I'm in the desert, I don't have anything, but I have a glass of water, and the guy next to me doesn't have this glass of water, I will feel very fortunate. So everything is relative, and also in biology. Whatever we see in the society, it happens to be that we can see it also in the cellular level. So what we said, we said, okay, let's take a person, increase his tissue oxygenation to very high level, and take it off. Take the high level out. There will be a sharp decline, and this decline can be interpreted by our body like hypoxia, lack of oxygen, even though I don't have luck. But relative to what I have, now is a decline. 
We call it the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox. And then we can have the HIF all with all the genes that are related to it. Does it work? Yes, because otherwise I would have told you another story. <laughs> <laughs> we can see it on the cellular level. We are taking cells, expose them to hyperoxia, high oxygen, and then go back to normal oxygen, and you can see the HIF, how it's going up, even though over here we don't have hypoxia. We had the trigger before. We can see it on the brain of different animal models. Here we are looking at the brain of a mice. And we can see it also in human beings that are coming for repeated hyperbaric treatment. And you can see that along the treatment, when we are measuring the HIF, the hypoxic induced factor, we can see a significant increase if we are doing it on a daily basis. Meaning that after this session, the general environment where we are now is being interpreted by the body like hypoxia, even though there is no lack of oxygen at all. So by that, we can generate the HIF. So we have another good thing that we established. Another thing, stem cells. I think that most people here in the audience understand what stem cells is, but if I need it for the parents or those who don't understand too much, you know that whoever created us knew that there will be a problem, that we will need repairs. The only thing he didn't know is what type of repair a certain pe person will want. So instead of giving us repairs, even though we have two kidneys and two eyes, and I think that the kidneys are the most important organ in our body, and I'm objective. <laughs> Instead of giving us repairs, he gave us three-dimensional printer. The three-dimensional printer, this is the stem cell. He said, print it yourself. You have a problem in the skin, print your skin. You have a problem in the bone, print your bone. And these are the stem cells. And the stem cells are starting to replicate when they have a signal of a problem. And as I said before, we know how to generate the signals. We are taking the oxygen up and then take it back to normal. And we can see an amazing thing over here also. Look what happened in long treatment. We can see the increase in hematopoietic stem cells. This is for patients, not in animal studies. And this is what happened with the mesenchymal stem cells. Mesenchymal stem cells are kind of cells that we have in the tissue. We can see them in the blood. So we have energy, we have trigger, we have the stem cells. The last thing that we need is angiogenesis, generation of new blood vessels. What do we need for that? We need the trigger, we have it. We need the stem cells, we have it. So we can see angiogenesis. We can look at the tissue itself in animal models. We can see the angiogenesis in the brain. And in human beings, we are not taking the brain out in order to see the angiogenesis. We have to use an MRI. So we can see perfusion MRI, cerebral blood flow before, after treatment. And over here, this is the delta between the before and after. Everything that is marked in red is more than 50% increase. Cerebral blood flow increase, cerebral blood volume, and MTT is the mean transient time. If a molecule of oxygen is going to the brain, how much time it takes to consume it? Taking it all together, we can see an amazing thing. We can see angiogenesis in the brain, which is something that I was taught in medical school, along of a lot of other things that cannot happen. But here it is. We see it. So after having the basic ingredients that we need for a generation, the next challenge is how do we choose the optimal wound? Because not every wound we can cure. For example, over here we have necrotic. And we need also to set the expectation with the patient of what's going to happen. And this is amazing what people tell you. You can sit in front of a patient and tell him, based on the test that you are doing, I don't think that your hand will move, but I think that your cognitive will improve and you will be able to read and remember what you read again. And many people say, oh, if my hand is not moving, then 
I don't need it. He said, okay. On the other far side, there was a big rabbi here in Israel, which is, is, is just amazing. He had a stroke. And after the stroke, he was on a wheelchair and couldn't walk, but his cognitive was severely declined. He has a big yeshiva. And his main concern was that he could not uh, learn with somebody and, and do a challenging, intellectual challenging. And he got the treatment. He has improved significantly. He wrote a book. At the end of the treatment, he told me, Shai, I needed to have this rock and the process that I have been to because he gave, it gave me a lot of insights. Now I understand a lot of things that I didn't understand before. And he wrote the book and he came to me to sit with me with the book. I enjoy spending time with him. And we are speaking how he's learning again, how we're learning Shevruta again, and all of that. And I was telling him, but look, you can also walk. He said, ah, this is not important. So everybody has his priorities for different things. I'm not judging, but we need to set the expectation for before. So how, how do we choose the optimal one? For that, we needed to see people here that are coming from math and from physics. I saw you, that you are learning mathematics, yeah? So this is kind, these kind of things doctors don't know how to do. People think that we are smart, but we are not, okay? It only looks like this, okay? So this is the real people doing. We have in our team people that are coming from physics, from math. That's, that's how we work. And what we have developed over here is a way to look at the brain in a simplified way. It's a combination of metabolic imaging together with anatomical imaging of the brain. And in order to simplify it to people like me, what we are doing, this is somebody who had a stroke. The blue area is a necrotic area. The necrotic area is the part that we don't have anything over there, so we cannot help. This is before, this is after. You see the necrotic area doesn't change. And the green area is an area that is non-functioning metabolic, but is still there, okay? And this area can improve. And whatever is related to this area will happen. But we are, not treating, we are not treating the hand, we are not speaking the movement, we are not treating cognitive, we are treating wounds. We only need to characterize the wounds that we want to treat. Is that point clear? Another example, look at this. She had a stroke two years before. She cannot move the hand and the leg. This is the area over here. It's green, meaning it's not necrotic. Cannot move the, right, the hand and the leg the hand and the leg are moving. Not because we treated the hand and the leg, because this one was related to it. Cannot speak, this is the Broca area. She's a fuzzy, she cannot speak. Cannot speak and can speak again. But again, we are not treating speaking capabilities. We are not treating motor capabilities. We are treating wounds. Whatever related to this one will happen. That's it. That's the main issue. That's the new paradigm. We are looking at the tissue. We are treating wounds. That's it. So we have wounds now from a lot of variety. We have stroke, as you saw before. We have traumatic brain injury. We have age-related functional decline. This last part is also very exciting. And I will say a couple of words about each one. We spoke about stroke. Traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury is mechanical injury to the brain. The brain is damaged. But there is, in traumatic brain injuries, they are a very, very challenging and interesting group. The group which is called mild traumatic brain injury. How we define mild traumatic brain injury? Remember, we are physicians, we are not so smart. We are saying, depends how much time this patient lost his conscience. If it was less than an hour, this is mild even though it can be total loss, okay? But because he lost his conscience for less than that, this is mild for me. Moderate, 12, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the people that have mild traumatic brain injury usually fully recover, but some not. The classical example for mild traumatic brain injury, let's say I'm driving a car, I have a car accident, my head moves like that, okay? And what we have in the brain, we have two layers. 
We have the outside layers, which we call the cortex, and we have the inside layer. The viscosity of each of this layer, or the mass of each of this layer, is different. So if it's different and we have a force on it, it will move with a different velocity. What can happen when this is occurring? The small blood vessels in between can tear down. If that happens, we have a limiting factor for the recovery, which is hypoxia, lack of oxygen. And this patient will not heal. Now, these people are, suffer, I don't know how to tell you. They will come and say, my cognitive is not good. I cannot read, I cannot write. We as physicians, we will do to them what? We will do a CT scan of the brain or MRI. We see the anatomy normal. If the anatomy normal, I'm coming to the patient and when I'm telling him, you are okay. Okay, you are normal. Even though he cannot read. Instead of saying, I'm stupid, I don't know what you have, I'm saying, you are okay. The problem is, is you. And this is a classical example. A woman, 55 year, 51 year old, she went down the bus, fell down, she had brain injuries, nothing more. She was, she is still a scientist. She's teaching at the university. And after this small fall, she couldn't read, she couldn't write, she couldn't memorize, because she couldn't function on the daily routine. And she went to the doctor, she did a standard CT, told her everything is normal, it's only your mental problem. She received psychiatric medication, divorce, cannot teach, etc., etc. This is the classical way. And then we are doing metabolic imaging of the brain. And we see, surprisingly, this is looking at the brain from downstairs. You can see the frontal lobe. We see the wound here. We see in the temporal lobe. We see the actual biology that is responsible for her clinical condition. This is before treatment. This is after treatment. Now she's back in the university and she's part of our research group. And you can see how the cognitive is improving. Not because we treated her cognitive function. We are treating wound. We saw a wound, we treat the wound. And this part related to it. That's what it is. We are still together. Now we can see the brain in a much better way. We have an MRI that we call MRI DTI that we can actually look at the nerve fibers and see how they are. And we see amazing thing. We see neurogenesis, generation of new neurons in the brain. This is before treatment, after treatment. And again, this is another thing that I was taught in medical school that cannot happen. So keep in mind, whatever you are learning today, Debate, okay? Debate everything. That's what you need to do. Everything we can debate. What we know today is not what we know a year from today or 10 years from today. So we see neurogenesis, generation of new neurons, amazing. We are working on the biggest epidemic that we as a Western society have, which is the age-related functional decline. This is the number one threat to the Western society. Because if somebody is reaching the point of dementia, that he cannot function his cognitive, it's a threat not only to him, to all the family that surround him, and all the society that need to support him along the way. And this is an epidemic because the numbers are growing all the time. So what's going on in the age-related cognitive decline? In, if I'm a, a patient, I'm going to my physician, let's say I'm 75, I'm going to my physician, I'm telling my dear physician, I'm feeling that my memory is a little bit declining. Remind me what your name was. Okay? He will say, okay, I understand that your cognitive is declining, let's do an MRI. He will look at the MRI, and this is the MRI of a classical 75, healthy. You can see these patches spread all over, and this is somebody young. And my physician will reply to me, my dear patient or my dear friend, excuse me for the word, you are fucked, but you are fucked according to your age, so this is normal. I don't want to be according to my age. I want to be 
better. I want to fully function. So what is this white patches over here? There is a wonderful work done in Canada where they took people who are 75 years or older, fully healthy, and they have done to them an MRI on a weekly basis. And since they have done the MRI on a weekly basis, we can look at it as a movie, horror movie, which is the aging process. So this is what we spoke before, and now we will look at it. First week, second week, third week, whoops. This is tiny stroke, occlusion of small blood vessels. The patient doesn't feel anything. Whoops, another one. Whoops, another one. Weeks. Okay, it's weeks. Whoops. These people don't seem to be fully healthy. Okay. This is the classical aging process. That's what aging and every time something like that happens, we are losing additional part of the brain. This is the amyloid plaque. What we thought in the past is that the amyloid plaque are responsible for the development of Alzheimer's disease. Today we understand that the amyloid plaque are not the cause, are a marker of process that happen in the brain. And if we are looking at this, we can see the amyloid plaque, which is exactly a long the blood vessels. And we have challenged it. I don't know if there are people over here that are at Tel Aviv University, but this is with the group of Uri Asheri. We are taking mice who are genetically engineered to develop Alzheimer, okay, genetically engineered, and we are giving them the hyperbaric because we know that we have, with the hyperbaric we can generate the new blood vessels and the stem cells. And you can see the amyloid plaque over here, and that's what happened when we are giving them a certain protocol of the hyperbaric treatment. The amyloid plaque disappeared. Not because we have removed the amyloid plaque, because we are changing the basic of the development. Another thing that we see is neurogenesis. We can see generation of new neurons. Unlike human beings, here we are actually taking the tissue out so we can count the number of neurons. You don't have to count over here because you see it immediately. And this is, again, you know, when I'm teaching the students, I ask them, how do you know if something is working? How do you know? So I'm opening a discussion. It's usually a one-hour discussion, so I will save it from you. And they are saying, if it's this kind of parameter, which is continuous, we can use T-test, we can use that P-value, etc., etc. And what I have to tell you, if something is working, you don't need statistics. If you need statistics, you are in a big problem. If it's really happening, if it's a real something that you should give your life to, and this is the point you are, you understand it when you see it. You don't need statistics. If you see it, go. Dedicate your life for it. If you need statistics, think again. Okay? That's an important message. We have now a big study where we are taking normal aging population, 65 years or older, fully potent. Okay? They are active, they don't have any disease, no diabetic, no stress, nothing. We are letting them age, and this is the hippocampus, the part in the brain that is responsible for the short memory. You can see what happened. We, are, we can see in the DTI the amount of neurons. You can see what happened along the process and then into the treatment. You can see an increase. Why I can go on with that? Why I can dedicate for that? Because I don't need statistics. Okay, you see it, you understand. You see the generation. We see the angiogenesis in the hippocampus. A long aging and then reverse it. Not slowing, reverse it. So it's a good direction. So we have a program for that. Another thing. But again, keep in mind, we are treating wounds. It looks like we are treating a lot of things, or we have different programs for different things, but we have a program only for one thing, for wounds that are located in the brain that are according to our characteristics. Another very interesting thing is fibromyalgia. We call it central sensitization syndrome. And with regard to that, 
if I want to explain to you what this disease is, I don't know if you are familiar with Frida Kahlo. She had fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia, it means that you have pain all over, all the time, but in any location that you feel the pain, you don't have a problem, okay? Unfortunately, for many years, and there are still many physicians, that the patient will come to them and will tell him, I'm feeling pain all over. He will do the test. He will have nothing in the test. He will tell the patient, you don't have anything. This is arrogant. Say, I'm stupid. I don't know what you have. But don't say you don't have. And by this painting, look how Frida Kahlo described it. And you don't need to say anything. You see? You understand what it means. Look at this one. This time, every time, it makes me cry when you look at it. Today, we understand that the main problem in fibromyalgia is not where you feel the pain. The main problem is in the pain interpretation. Is in the brain, in the brain part that are responsible for analyzing the signals that are coming from the periphery. If you have a problem in this loop, then it's like having false alarm. Let's say we have an alarm now, but it's a false alarm, and you feel it all the time. I can tell you that it's false, but, but it's terrible to live with an alarm. So this is the problem. In the first study that we have done, we have a significant improvement in all parameters of fibromyalgia. And for the first time, we have patients with fibromyalgia, and three months afterwards without fibromyalgia. By doing that, it enables us to map the brain area that are responsible for the pain interpretation, which is very exciting because I think that in a couple of years from today, if somebody will come with fibromyalgia, we will not tell her based only on the clinical symptom. Let's look at your brain. And we'll say, oh, you have fibromyalgia from this type or from this type. You are suitable for that treatment or for that treatment. But finally, we will say you have a real biological disease. It's not fiction. Okay, so this is with regard to fibromyalgia. An exciting thing happened to us, and the most exciting things happen to you when you don't expect it. Because if you can expect it based on the database that you have, a lot of scientists around the world have the same database. So it won't be a real innovation. But if you are doing a research, and your goals in the research was that and that will happen. And another thing happened to you. Don't be frustrated. The opposite. Saying, wow, this is exciting. Now I have something new that nobody has. And learn it. And what happened to us in this study is several of the patients have a recovery of repressed memory. Which is, you know, this is way, 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 way behind my scoop, at least. Somebody who enjoys physiology like me, this is, this is my wife part. She's a social worker. This is not me. But few of the patients had recovery of years that they didn't know that they had it anyway. And during that years, they had sexual child abuse. And we have proved the memories, meaning we went back based on what they said, we went to the sources and confirmed with them that what they are describing really happened. I must tell you that if I needed to write a horror movie, I wouldn't think about the scenarios that this patient had. And we thought, what's happening over here? And again, we have their brain, so we can see the changes in the brain activity. So we came to a theory that Everything is related. What do I mean by that? If you are taking a small child who had abuse, this child, usually the abuse is not a single event. It usually happened from somebody who is close to him, in most cases. And it's a repeated event. By the way, the numbers in Israel, you know what are the numbers? One in five. This is amazing, not only in Israel. It's in all the Western world. This is an amazing work of, uh, of Rachel Lev that she has done. One of five. Okay? 
So this child has to go through the abuses again and again and survive in this environment. So what does he do? He is doing dissociation. If you want to interpret a dissociation from the psychological world into pure biology, what is dissociation? You want to disconnect several parts of your brain. How do you disconnect? You are not taking blood flow to this area. You are doing that for a significant period of time. You have a wound because there is lack of oxygen that takes you a lot of time to happen. And we can see the wound. So now we have a study, we have done a study on fibromyalgia that the trigger for the fibromyalgia was child abuse. Again, emotional thing that affects dramatically the biology. And in order to prove the connection, we have a work that we are doing with Hagit from Be'er Sheva. We need to see the tissue, we need to see the wound. So we have a model for stress, severe stress in rats. How do you cause severe stress to a rat? You are exposing them for one hour for a urine of a cat. Okay, you just take the rat, expose him one hour to urine and cat, you don't touch it. And you are taking the brain out months after the acute exposure. You are looking at the brain, you see a wound. Okay, you can see actually a wound, which is a biological barrier. And based on this, we can see what happens if it's a simple TBI, traumatic brain injury, and PTSD, and we can characterize the wounds. And that's become a whole new area of field. In Israel, and I brought this because, you know, today evening is the Memorial Day. We have soldiers, and among the soldiers we have what we call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. This is actually the backyard of our society. We know that we are sending the best of our best, for me children, because I have children now in the army. I'm looking at myself as a child <laughs> still, but still they are going to the army. And we are taking the best of the best to be paratroopers, to be fighters, to be in tanks, and all of this. And they can be exposed to severe traumatic event. And because of that, after this event, they have zero function. Nightmares, cannot think, cannot function. All the day is fully destroyed. And unfortunately, nothing helps. And in Israel, we are really giving our soldiers the best of the best all the time. But we have a blockage that we cannot overcome. And we have now a significant research program where we are taking veterans, soldiers. We are taking them into our program. And first, we are starting by demonstrating the wound in the brain. And for that, we are doing the so-called functional MRI. And you can see here normal people. And you can see the PTSD people. You don't need to speak. You can see that these parts of the brain are actually non-functioning, even though the anatomy is normal. And again, we see a wound which characterizes the wound. And those of these soldiers who have the wounds with the characteristics that we need are going into the program. An amazing thing happened, like you see over here, see before and after. You can see how these areas are being enlightened. And suddenly they can sleep, they can read, they can concentrate, they are going back to the university. There is a big issue now of what do we do with their compensation, because you know they are used to get compensation. So I have a discussion now with the Agafa Shikum Shel Tzal. I'm telling them, leave them with the compensation. Don't touch the compensation. Let's bring them back to life. It doesn't matter. They will walk, they will die. Say, no, but if he's walking, I'm taking his compensation out. <laughs> but then they, the soldiers don't want to report of how good they are because they want to continue with the compensation. So that's the issue that we are dealing now, but this is a good issue. Okay, we will solve that. I don't know how, but we will solve that. But they are going back to normal life, which is, which is huge. And you can see how suddenly 
we can see a new thing. And we are starting, like you spoke, with diving. And then we are going to environment. And then we have started with stroke. And then we saw what happened in the stroke. So I say, okay, it can be good for TBI. And then say, right, just a minute, I have a problem with fibromyalgia. What's going on in fibromyalgia? You see that. And then you have PTSD that is coming up. And if somebody would have come to me, let's say, five years ago, three years ago, and will tell me that I will deal with child abuse, with PTSD, I'll tell you, no way. This is not me. I'm physiology. And look what happened. If somebody would have come to me 10 years ago and will told me that I will deal with the brain, I would say, no way, this is not me, this is boring, okay? Nothing happened in neurology. And if somebody would have come to me 15 years ago and tell me, you will deal with hyperbaric medicine, I would say, no way, I'm only a diver. I will not deal with that, I'm doing nephrology. So, I don't know what to tell you, your life will take you, but they will take you to any place they will take you. The most important thing is every time that you have something in your hand, it usually doesn't happen by chance. And if you have the opportunity to do something good, and when I'm saying good, is good for the general society, for other people. If you have something, opportunity to do something do, good, do it. Because if you will not do it, you are doing bad, and the universe will struck you. <laughs> okay? So we are all counting on you. And thank you very much again for everything you are doing. And thank you all scientists for choosing to deal with scientists, to deal with the unknown, and debate everything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chai, for an outstanding, amazing lecture. Uh, you can have the right, okay. yes. I'm going to ask you a question, okay? So, you mentioned that the, the reason for the erythropoietic effect and uh, angiogenesis and all of that stuff is the gradient between pure oxygen and normal oxygen, and it's the gradient that creates it. I come from uh, a, sports. Sports, a sports background where, an, an endurance sports background, where uh, athletes go to, uh, I have a loud voice, <laughs> uh, okay, uh, where athletes go to altitude to get this erythropoietic effect in order to, so that when they return to sea level and compete in competitions, marathons, uh, Tour de France, you name it, uh, Giro, uh, 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 that, they, that they have more, uh, more red blood cells, that they have a higher hematocrit, and they perform better. But there are athletes that, that don't respond to this. They're non-responders. So despite going to altitude or simulated altitude, uh, uh, in your hyperbaric chamber, you have pure oxygen, in normal, it's 22%, right? 23%? 21%. Yeah. 21%, whatever. And there are some people who go to altitude. By the way, at, at altitude, it's also... Uh, what's, the, what's the percentage? I'm going to test the scientists. What is the percentage of oxygen Saturation. at altitude? Correct, smart people. I'm, we're in a room of smart people. It's the same, it's the same. The air is thinner, which is why you're getting less oxygen, but it's the same. So, uh, as opposed to what you're doing, and as opposed to there are uh, hypoxic rooms, or hypoxic chambers, where you reduce, you increase the nitrogen, and you reduce the oxygen, and you bring it down to, I don't know, 12% oxygen, and you simulate altitude. What you're doing is you're adding oxygen and then bringing them back, so you're, simi you're creating this gradient. There are, there are people who are non-responders. They just don't respond. The, the, the erythropoietic effect doesn't happen. Um, do you come across patients like that where you, and you, you have your, your functional MRIs and you're seeing uh, brain activity, 
do you come across people who don't respond, number one, in the brain, or number two, in wounds? Uh, you know, uh, visible wounds like, like you showed, uh, do you have people who are non-responders? Of course. That's biology. You know, nature, when it generates us, it generates versatility. Why do we have such a huge, huge, it's not huge if you're looking in general, but a versatility between us? Because we don't know what, how, how the conditions surrounding us will change. And something that is currently, let's say, a disadvantage to me at this environment can be an advantage in a different environment. I can give you a classical example. You know that Afro-Americans that come from Africa to the U.S. have a kind of anemia, have a kind of sickle, sickle cell anemia, anemia okay? which in the African environment is a protective value for them from the malaria. Okay? So they, they will be the one that will replicate more in Africa condition. But when they are coming to the Western society, different type of food can cause crisis of cycle cell and they can die from it. Okay? So in the Western society, their percentage is being declining. So we need this versatility between us because the condition may change. So of course there is variability and of course there are people that don't respond to the treatment in the way we think they should. We are now in around 80% of the people that respond according to what we expect. But this is where all the people here come together. We have people that are working with us on the AI, on the artificial intelligence. They are not physicians. They are coming from math, they are coming from computer science, they are coming from things like that. They don't even see the patient. You get the data inside and you get the output. What's amazing about it, nobody what ha knows what happened in the box, okay? And we have done now a study where we did use AI for patients with traumatic brain injury to participate what type of cognitive function will improve after the treatment. And you are taking data in and the computer is accurate in more than 95% of the cases of what will happen, the memory, the... I, I don't have a clue what happened in the box, okay? So, to add, respond to your question, of course, this is biology. That's what beautiful and that's what terrible in biology. It's the versatility that we have among us. I assume that the more data we get, the more information, the more multidiscipline team will work together and everybody will bring to the table additional things, we will be able to predict in a better way what is the optimal treatment, not necessarily the hyperbaric, whatever it is, for the specific individual. Okay? So we have a lot of things to do more. Yes. That's why we need you. Okay. Thank you again, Silvan, for the great question. And thank you, Ty, for the great